Thank you very much for inviting me to give this course. And this is, um, yeah, it's the first time that I'm giving a similar course to this one. So I'm uh, quite, I was quite interested to, to see how to structure it. So it's designed also specifically uh, with you guys in mind. And um, I actually come from a background of uh, my first degree was in uh, communications and media studies and journalism. So that's, uh, I did a three year degree in uh, media and communication studies. And then I switched over to studying in part of economic history, and ecological economics and political ecology. And in the uh, video works that I do, I'm obviously uh, combine things from from, all, from both, uh, both uh, disciplines in my life. Um, I'm not going to be showing so much of my films today, although if I had, uh, I was hoping to show you a rough cut of, uh, of a film that I, I'm working on at the moment, but I, if you guys are coming to the Deep Growth Summer, to the Deep Growth Conference in, uh, in September in Germany, you'll have to wait to, to see it then because I feel that it's not uh, exactly audience ready at this point. Um, so what I'm trying to do today essentially is that you're not, um, I mean, these aren't really things that you can teach in one day, um, all the aspects of filmmaking, you know, this idea of doing the crash course, talking about persuasion techniques and storytelling techniques and all the technical aspects of filmmaking. So um, I don't think that it's going to be, I'm, I'm not going to comprehensively cover all aspects of filmmaking. Uh, I think the main idea is to kind of like, give you the basic tools to begin to conceptualize what it would entail if you want to take the ideas that you're working with in research and turn these into a documentary storytelling film. And that's uh, the emphasis of what I'm going to focus on today, is like a narrative documentary film, and discussing different options to do so, and then some of the basic uh, technical things to keep in mind, and specifically the, the, the process of interviewing, which is you know slightly different than interviewing or researching. Or <laughs> silence. <coughs> Did he close it because it's too hot? No. no. I mean, too, 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 too loud. Oh, okay. I mean, it's okay, but yeah, this is fine now. Um, okay, so in the morning, I'm going to be talking first about uh, persuasion, uh, storytelling, and narrative structure and then some questions about the ethics of filmmaking and the positionality of the filmmaker. And then in the, uh, we're gonna, in the second part of the morning, uh, we're going to do uh, an exercise working in groups to workshop a bit story ideas, kind of based a bit on what we've been talking about this morning. And um, in the afternoon, I'm gonna discuss more the technical aspects of filming uh, creating shots, setting up the interview, doing the interview, and then at the end I didn't uh, create much space for kind of more practical questions about budgeting and writing proposals and so on and so forth, but I, we can just have a talk about it and you guys can ask me anything, anything you're interested in. And I prepared a really lovely PowerPoint with implanted videos, but uh, since <laughs> We weren't able to use my Mac, and uh, I'm going to have to be switching back and forth between the PowerPoint and the video, so bear with me in that regard. Okay, so uh, just a basic uh, introduction to start off. What, what is documentary? Um, documentary is considered to be factual films that use dramatic elements or Grierson, who is one of the fathers of the documentary film form from the National Film Board of Canada, uh, referred to it as a creative treatment of actuality. So 
Within documentary, um, it's considered to be a type of portrayal of the truth, but using creativity. And the idea is you are allowed to use recreations. You are allowed, in a way, to play often with reality. And this is kind of this uh, underlying theme in a documentary, and these questions about how much, how much is it possible to represent reality? Is there an objective truth? Can you move towards truth, and do you have the responsibility? How much can you, how much can you manipulate truth in order to present truth as you see it to your audience? Um, so, these are some of the definitions. And I'm just going to move straight to talking about persuasion and propaganda because the other aspect of documentary filmmaking is that it's often a factual film that is intending to convey some sort of a message. And um, there's another question that we can ask is, is there, a, is there a difference between propaganda and persuasion? So just kind of let's keep that question in mind. I'm not going to answer it for you right now. Um, if we thinking of propaganda is ways that a communicator can move audiences towards political or social action, um, propaganda can also be considered different techniques that I'm going to go through some of these different techniques using examples from films. Um, so when we're trying to persuade somebody, um, we, it's uh, very useful always to return to uh, Aristotle's rhetoric, uh, basic, uh, basic elements of persuasion. And I think this is very helpful when we're watching documentary films and we're trying to analyze how they're working on us and how they're persuading us so that we can emulate this in our own, in our own films. And Aristotle said, of the three modes of persuasion furnished by the spoken word, there are three kinds. Persuasion is achieved by the speaker's personal character when the speech is spoken, so as to make him make us think him credible. Credible. Secondly, persuasion may come through the hearers when the speech stirs their emotions. Thirdly, persuasion is affected through the speech itself when we have proved a truth or an apparent truth by means of a persuasive argument suitable to the case in question. And um, this can be divided into, or Aristotle divided it into these three types of persuasive appeals. The first one is referred to is logos. So this is uh, the actual information or the argument about the issue, appeal to reason. So if I say two plus two is four, uh, then I can give you a series of proofs that will actually establish that this is the case. So this is using logos in order to make an argument, or you can say they're using science, for example, the same. Um, ethos is based on the credibility of the speaker, and it's the appeal of trust and respect to the speaker. So this man is a doctor, and he says blank and blank and blank. Therefore, I trust him because I know that he's a doctor. Or in a documentary film, a lot of times you will be able to establish the ethos of different speakers in different ways. And this is, we'll see some examples from films. And then uh, pathos is kind of the emotional feeling you have about when you are being persuaded. And it's uh, how you identify with the speaker and how they're able to appeal to your emotions. So, um, yeah, uh, normally academic journals' arguments might be mainly logos, although often we'll just, uh, you know, reference previous authors, <laughs> in which case we're talking a lot about ethos, right? Oh, so-and-so said so, therefore we consider that it's true because we've already established the credibility of this speaker. And um, I think it's kind of moving from, you know, academic writing to documentary filmmaking or to dramatic storytelling, the even, you know, kind of the tricky part is specifically to appeal to the pathos and how do we get uh, people emotionally to become invested in the stories that we're interested to tell. Um, so there's no better way necessarily to make arguments. Usually you use all three of those different 
forms of argumentation. And yeah, for example, uh, logic and evidence, of course, are privileged if you're doing a, if you're looking at scientifically what the what the truth is. Uh, but not everybody can be an expert, so we always need to rely on experts. Hence the importance of ethos and yeah, the importance of emotion. If we don't care about it, nobody's going to watch your film in the first place. So how do we actually get people to become care enough that they want to watch the film and when they're watching it that they feel something? Um, so I'm going to use a film, I don't know if many of you guys have seen it, uh, Fahrenheit 911, yeah, I think I saw it. <laughs> so it's kind of old, uh, but it was, came out in, what year was it, 2004. Um, but it's actually, not only this film, but a lot of the, the works of Michael Moore are kind of held up as a modern day example of the use of different propaganda <coughs> techniques in, in film. And I'll go through now briefly just some of the types of techniques that uh, this is a, a writer, Kelton Rose, who kind of highlighted, he wrote a paper detailing all these different techniques, how they were used in the film. And uh, then we'll watch a little bit of an excerpt to see some of the techniques in action. And then we'll watch a couple of other clips of films just to begin to think about how, um, how these techniques are being used and how we're not actually normally very, very aware of them. Um, I came across this stuff, I took a class in, uh, in, in propaganda when I was studying communications in university. And uh, I'm the, I mean, the, the basic idea about propaganda is that it's actually usually used uh, to convince people that already share the same perspective as the propagandist is, is directing themselves to. So a lot of these techniques uh, that you see in the films, if you're not sympathetic to the idea, right away you, you, you unveil it as an act of propaganda and you say, oh, well, this is ridiculous or this is ridiculous. Uh, when you are sympathetic, you tend to not be as critical towards these types of persuasion. So obviously, uh, the idea of emissions, which is something that happens all the time, um, you just leave out important information that would be counter to the point that you want to make. So you're not mm, you're not lying, of course, but you're just not uh, you're just not telling the whole truth. And uh, in the film Fahrenheit 911, for example, one of the emissions that they pointed out was the fact that you don't actually see ever the Twin Towers uh, because this would create a certain type of emotion of anger. And this wasn't the emotion that he would want the audience to have at that point in time. Um, this is a, the main, another, and perhaps one of the most important ones that we use constantly in uh, documentaries is contextualization and juxtaposition. Um, how do you put images against one another? How do you juxtapose them on top of one another in order to create a connection between two, between two images? So in one scene you have somebody, a fat person eating in a restaurant, and afterwards you have some starving children in the street and obviously by juxtaposing those two scenes the implication is that this person is uh, you know eating at the expense of the children and um, so this is also using this uh, taking advantage of the, the, the pathos because you uh, in psychology, you say that the emotions bleed from one scene to another. So you establish an emotion, and uh, you could be sad or upset or whatever it is, and then you pass to another scene, and that will color how you how you see the scene. For example, here we see we see a scene of grief and suffering, and then you pass to somebody that's smiling and happy, and the viewer is like, oh, what a cruel, cold person. This is a use of juxtaposition. Um, cynicism. So this is how we um, can be cynical about what other people do. It's also uh, imputing negative intentions to people's actions. 
Um, so when this scene in the film when Bush is sitting there reading My Pet Goat to the, uh, to the, to the preschool children, and uh, Michael Moore very brilliantly manipulates it so that he says, oh, what was Bush thinking in those moments? Is he thinking I've been hanging out with the wrong crowd? And maybe I should have, you know, uh, uh, invited the Saudis to my ranch in Texas, and so on and so forth. So this, it works very powerfully because obviously he can't, we don't actually know what he's thinking at that moment, but um, by imputing these negative uh, <coughs> behaviors to his character, it, and then there's uh, traps, which um, you can call either way you go, you're screwed. So, uh, for example, in the film, uh, Bush is presented as a total fool and an idiot, but at the same time, he's uh, this master manipulator. So, which one is it? So, this is often a way that you set things up in a documentary. You know, oh, they're evil and they're terrible, but they're also really stupid. So, which way does it work, right? This is my absolute favorite one. Um, and I have tried to integrate it. In, I mean, I've seen that it can work really well, so you can use it in your own films. This is the idea of um, that if somebody in their life has made, has made a big transformation or a U-turn, they become a much more uh, credible communicator. And this is related to the, what we talked about, the, um, the ethos of, of the characters. Uh, one common example of this is that in an AA meeting, or in a, you know, drug, uh, people recovering from drugs, the person with the most credibility will be the worst drug user. Because they have really been there, they've seen the, you know, the bottom of the barrel, and they've been able to pick up their lives again and to come around. So when, they, when a drug user like that comes and talks to your school, for example, about using drugs, he obviously has much more credibility when he says, don't use drugs, than somebody that's never tried drugs, right? Mm -hmm. And um, this is a tool that's, um, I mean, actually I'm sure in the clip that we'll see, it's used a few times. Um, and I think the most powerful use of this in this film is this woman, Lila Lipscomb. Mm -hmm that um, it, it's kind of built in such a way that it appears that she used to be conservative and you know, she, she um, totally opposed to protesting against the war, or war families, so on and so forth. And throughout the film we see her transformation. And this becomes a very, very powerful argument. Um, and I mean, this is also related to being able to see change in characters and to see how characters dynamically change through time, and that makes it has a much more powerful emotional impact. Um, and then there's, of course, pacing and distraction. Um, you have a lot of music, a lot of fast cuts, a lot of clips at certain points in time that perhaps you're not able to cut perfectly absorb everything that is being told to you. And um, the other one is numeric deceptions, which um, actually, I mean, we use them all. They're very, very often used, not only in documentary films, of course, also in all kinds of media and journalistic uh, uh, forms of, of persuasion. So, for example, when he starts at the beginning of the film, uh, Michael Moore says, Bush was on vacation for 42% of the time during his first 229 days in office. And what he's referring to is actually uh, the time that Bush spent uh, not in Washington um, and that he was, you know, that he can, he's not in Washington, he's on vacation, which is obviously a misperception. And I noticed the same. I remember when I saw the bowling for Columbine also, I was really disturbed by a lot of the now. Well, I was also disturbed as a Canadian because, you know, he tries to make uh, Canada seem like this paradise where nobody locks the doors. It's like, let's open one door and it's still locked. <laughs> therefore, therefore, nobody in Canada locks the doors. 
And until today, I meet people all the time, and it's one of the first things they say to me, nobody in Canada locks their doors. <laughs> but, but it just shows you how, how persuasive that was for people, because it was so shocking for them. They were like, wow, this, you know, they're really willing to believe this. And another uh, uh, numeric deception he used in, sort of in Bowling for Columbine is that I remember he, at one point, he, this, this one was very strange. He's trying to make the argument that um, it's not the amount of guns that lead to that lead to the high crime rate in America, but it's television. So at one point he says there's actually more guns in Canada than there is in the United States. And I was I was after that film I was like that doesn't make any sense. How could that be? You know. So I looked into it and I looked into his statistics and then I figured out that. The guns, he was counting with the guns, including the guns of all the military and the police forces, and you know, comparing that with the number of personal handguns in the United States or per capita or whatever. So, I mean, there's so, so many ways that you can uh, manipulate numbers. Not that I'm recommending you should do. I, I, some of these techniques I would recommend more so than others. But, uh, okay, so I'm just. So we can just watch a little bit of a clip to see. I'm gonna answer, right? You guys ever think about joining up? Bad Bob. Gift to the country, you know, from your family. So I have my son in the army, pretty 
crowd uh, thank you. Oh, you know what? He made it. What was your reaction to the protesters during the state of the Gulf War or Vietnam? I always hated the protesters. I always hated the protesters. It was just a slap in the face. It was just like they were dishonoring my son. And I burned in my soul to tell them you don't understand. They're not there because they want to be there. But then I, I came to understand that they weren't protesting the men and the women that were there. They were protesting the concept of the war. And I'm a soldier and I'm here to do a job. I've been a soldier for a while. Once you have to go and do your job and you see the things that you see, uh, I was saying there's some disillusionment in that. But um, 
Yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a big success, and um, I mean, I don't know how much uh, of an influence it had in, um, in American politics at the time. But it's definitely, I think, um, part of kind of a new uh, wave of uh, blockbuster documentaries that uh, films coming out in, um, in theaters to very, very wide distribution that we, I think, kind of starting around, around this time. Um, okay, so I wanted to show a couple more clips. <coughs> Uh, to so that we can also look at some other uh, means of persuasion in film before we cross to the next um, section about storytelling. And the next ones I wanted to show was about um, the film Gaslands. Uh, so most of the films that I, most of the clips I'm trying to show are um, kind of, except for this one I think, are all related to uh, political questions around political ecology. Um, so Gaslands, uh, I guess, has anybody seen it? I'll hit the trailer and then I'll play the clip. Um, so it's been, it's been a, a, a huge, huge hit, especially in, in the impact that it's had as regards uh, communities not only in the United States, in the States, but all over the world. What's that? And uh, different mobilizations around uh, hydraulic fracturing. So specifically, uh, there's been a really strong community outreach where you know groups get together and they play this film in town halls. And uh, there's now a second Gasland 2 that's come out. Um, and it's, um, well, we'll see, it's the kind of the filmmaker's personal journey to discover the truth behind hydraulic fracturing. So, if it loads, I will play the trailer. And just, um, yeah, as you're watching it, just try to keep in mind some of these different uh, tools and methods that we can do through and different pacing uh, in terms of how, what techniques of persuasion is the film that you're using, is using ethos, pathos, logos. for a problem. 
Castland has a lot of pretty dramatic events. Where I would differ with Josh is his conclusions that those problems were all related to fracking. If people detect methane in their well, there are a number of sources right on their own property, right under their property, within either on the surface or within 100 feet or so. There's almost no likelihood of possibility that methane could migrate laterally from a natural gas well wherever it is. There's 10,000 wells that have been what we call frack out into microseismic, and it shows that literally you just you're not going to get into the ground wire. The fracturing itself is a process that occurs deep enough in the earth that, that uh, Groundwater Protection Council study in 2009 reported no problems uh, over the last 60 years with frac fluid migrating from the reservoir in the groundwater. And it took a well it uses anywhere from about two to eight million pounds of water to do the fracturing process, which is a lot of water. But in the end, the amount of water you use for that well over the lifetime of the well is actually quite low. Here are the casings we were just talking about, Shelly. You can see multiple layers of protection, cement, steel, heavy duty pipe, all designed to protect people's water supplies from the gas that would be in the well and the of production of the frac fluids when the well is being completed. Even though it's really sturdy like this, but I thought maybe you'd like a demonstration of just how much we're going to take some RDX high explosives. Sort of like dynamite, put it in here, set it off, and just see what happens. Well, when we first bought this place and moved in, a lady told me don't smoke in the shower. And I wondered what she was talking about. Has there been any drilling around here? No, there's no drilling around there, no problems. Oh, so no drilling, no fracking? No fracking, we had fracking in New York. We just have to show you what, I, what happens when I lay it on here. Are, 
in, I mean, Gasland is a good use of the tech. I mean, it has been proven to be a successful, a persuasive piece. It, it has worked and it's actually, you know, some people say it's contributed to uh, reassessing <coughs> fracking in certain regions of the United States. So it's also been a very potent political tool. And that's what he aimed to make, you know. Uh, Truth Lines, I think, has not been as successful. Yeah. And, I mean, actually it's interesting because I hadn't watched this whole trailer, but it's very interesting at the end that they do say that it is funded by the natural gas companies, which is, um, obviously detracts very, very significantly from their ethos because they say, yeah, we funded this movie, we didn't pay the experts to appear. Oh, okay, you didn't pay the experts. <laughs> it's, um, it always, yeah. Um, I just wanted to say that also the, the second one was totally lacking somehow in the pathos, no? I mean, this is what, because everybody was like so calm and like, oh, I think it's so beautiful, I don't understand. You know, like totally uh, relaxed and chill, and who's going to believe that? I mean, I, I mean, it's really like, I just, I just feel like you didn't. Yeah. But I think it's using like the contrast to the other movie. Yeah, totally, but the contrast is exaggerated, at least for me, I don't know. <laughs> what you have to think of what the kind of person this movie gears at is this type of yeah, mom. Yeah, I understand the, the reason, but they were it's, it's a mom and beautiful thing, I guess. Well, also, you have to keep in mind uh, that, you know, if you, I mean, the, the power of fear. I mean, in the first film, he's saying, this is a great way of danger, and we're being uh, tricked by our politicians, and, you know, we're sitting on top of, like, a gas mine, or whatever you want to call it, you know, that, you know, our water, everything, all this stuff is at stake. Whereas Truth Lands is trying to say, no, no, everything's okay, it's all okay. Obviously, that's not, it's not as compelling. I mean, it, it, from a, as you say, from the perspective of pathos, you're, what are you getting excited about, you know? It's like, okay, what everything's fine. Why do I what need you to watch the film then? Well, maybe you get relief. You know, maybe you get relief from the fear that uh, <laughs> watching <laughs> Gaza is dead. Yeah. And yesterday, you remember that a lot of uh, com <coughs> big, uh, companies work on uh, doubt. Mm. I think this was uh, the second uh, documentary did. And actually put it down. He didn't want to convince you that everything is fine, but just put it down and, okay, and leave the company continue its work because there is doubt. Mm. It's not that it's proven that yeah. we're doing wrong. Let's work on the doubt part. But that in itself, the fact that it's made as a reaction against another documentary, it's, it for me is, is a minimizing credibility. I mean, you are doing so much effort just to just to subvert or just to distract from another documentary. That's your purpose. I mean, you know what I mean? Like in that uh, sense, for me, yes. it's a loss of credibility. Obviously, <laughs> but, but it, it works like this. Really, I just realized the speaking of emotion from the first movie to the other one is like. Because after the second movie had no credibility to me, you know, because of the first one. Yeah. I think they like tried really hard to build their credibility or ethos because like they when they introduced the speakers like, oh yeah, three P A D like they totally exaggerated, oh yeah, the government listens to help. Yeah. I think that the movie's made for a different audience. It's not made for us, it's made for the farmers and the people that are there. So the music is for them, yeah. that's their music. The tranquility is their style of living, it's how they behave. They're not like agitated, like <laughs> activists. <laughs> They're not like uh, hysterical, they are just like <laughs> calm people, you know? And that's, uh, I mean, if you, if, if you, if you know this, this, this region and this, you know, this, this is a perfect movie for them. I think uh, it, it's very, it would be very convincing for, for, for the people that live there. Um, so I think it's a very well made documentary, actually. The first uh, or the second? No, the second. The second. Yeah. It's, it's, it's perfect for that audience, you know? That's a, I mean, uh, it's a mom, you know, in, in the US. In the US, this 
kind of family thing is very important. It's a mom with a typical family. She's a farmer. So she has all the legitimacy, you know, like in the world to speak. And then they interview also environmental people, environmental defense fund. I was really surprised. This is a very big, um, important environmental NGO in the U.S., the EDF. Well, so if you, and they, of course, they, they take, and, and I'm sure he said many other things and they took him out of context there, the EDF guy. But there's like other, there's a lot of people there that are, like, you see them and you don't know anything. You say, okay, they're experts and even environmentalists. So I think it's a... Uh, I mean, he could have been taken out of context, but you, I mean, considering a lot of uh, people, a lot of environmentalists are in favor of hydraulic fracturing because they think that it's less uh, damaging for climate change than coal or other forms of energy. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they could I mean, we do see a lot of people being taken out of context. I mean, some, I actually think some of the people he interviewed, yeah. like they made this joke like, um, that they re-interviewed some of the people from the other film who thought they were misrepresented. They presented one guy and they said, oh, this famous TV star. You know, there's also this, like, uh, the way they were using humor. I mean, it's very, it's trying to be very tongue-in-cheek of like, oh, he has three degrees. And, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's also kind of poking fun of itself and being self-referential, yeah. which also, I think, made it more... And also plays into the kind of whole, like, anti anti um, north northeastern uh, discourse uh, in the U.S. You know, anti the elites of the east of New York and uh, you know the exactly. filmmakers from New York. Exactly. Yeah, that fancy and, uh, New York filmmaker. Yeah. And, and then the one last thing I thought that it was very important uh, that they said that we didn't pay and that we did fund because they're already preventing the attack that was going to be made against the film, which is that all oh, the gas companies attack, uh, uh, funded this. So, it's, so they say, yeah, we funded it. So what? So what are you going to say now? So they already preempted your first attack. So this is a very good move strategically by, by them. So. Okay, so we're at the end of the first uh, section. Uh, we're and just the last point is that it uh, was mentioned previously, but it, uh, we just mentioned it briefly now, is the aspect of humor and how humor can be used to persuade. And uh, have you guys seen this film, uh, Super Size Me? Mm -hmm. Where yes. this uh, filmmaker says he's going to eat McDonald's every day for 30 days. So this is kind of a, an example of using comedy to make a... <coughs> And this is a quote from him. He says, When you start to laugh, your barriers come down. When you let the walls down, the protective obstacles that we keep all around us, without even realizing it, we, be, we become receptive to information or way of thinking that we hadn't had before. So other ways. This is related to what we said about the emotion of when we're feeling different forms of emotion, we're more receptive, we're more open to being influenced by ideas. Um, so are we taking a coffee break now? Uh, 11. 11. 11. 11. Oh, so we continue the yes. Okay. So 11. Okay. Yes. Next. <laughs> Next part. Uh, storytelling. So. Um, when we're deciding... Um, And 
what is the access or how are you going to obtain access to that world? So what uh, sort of privileged access do you have and what's your relationship with that world that makes you the person qualified to tell this story? So that's kind of a key question that you want to think about when you want to tell, tell a certain story. Um, the question is, what you know? Are you are you the best person to tell this film, and why? Right. And um, the other questions are finding finding an angle or a hook. What is the aspect that is going to make a viewer interested in your story? And often uh, the angle of the hook is based on some form of conflict or something that's unresolved, something that the viewer wants to find out, you know? So, um, you know, in, the, in Gaslands, perhaps it's, you know, what, uh, what would you do if somebody offered you $100,000 to frack on your land, you know? Um, so it's this idea of also leaving things a bit uncertain to a certain degree from the, the starting point, you know? Another question is, um, yeah, what is the purpose of your film and whose perspective are you telling it from? What is the point of view of the, of the filmmaker? And we're going to show, afterwards I'm going to show you a few clips that kind of take different perspectives and show how, how different filmmakers or how different themes can be approached differently. Um, for example, if you want to make a film, we're going to see some examples about uh, the diamond trade in Africa, right? What are different possible ways that you can enter into this story? Um, and then the question is of creating a narrative. How do you create, um, or how do you bring time and create kind of a chronological story arc into your story? Um, it might be something that's in the past, so you're telling a story that has already taken place, but when you're telling the story, you want to bring the viewers in at a certain point and you want the story to develop over time and to have a narrative structure that I'm going to show you the next scene of it. So this is also something that you should think about when you make a documentary, it's not just, oh, I want to make a, a film about fracking. No, it's about one man's journey across the country to find out how Americans are, blah, blah, So you already see that you have a chronological element of the story is moving through time. And the other question is, what are the visual materials that you have available to tell your story? Um, if you're telling a story that's, you know, something very, very technical, for example, they might be fascinating, but if you just have you know scenes of meetings of people sitting around, uh, it's not going to provide the visual material that you need. So, do you have uh, access to visual? Do you have access to visual material either that you can film yourself, or do you have access to archival materials, to photo stills? Can you create animations? Can you create graphics? And this is uh, probably one of the major difficulties of um, making documentary films is being able to visually illustrate everything that you're showing. Because otherwise you might as well just uh, write it down, no? So these are just some of the points that you think about before you uh, begin to... And I think all these, uh, all these aspects are included a little bit in the exercise that we're going to do together in groups. So I don't know if everybody brought um, a story idea, but I think that even if you didn't, you can kind of take the research that you're doing or one specific aspect of the research and just play with it a bit and see how you would theoretically develop it into, into a film idea, keeping some of these points in mind. Um, so, this is the classic uh, three-act structure for, uh, for storytelling, and I am not, all, uh, not all documentaries need to use this structure, but uh, I think it, it is useful to keep in mind, and um, a lot, uh, I mean, audiences 
are kind of trained to 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 you know experience stories using this type of structure. So the first act is the exposition. You set up the action. You introduce the characters, and you have something called the inciting incident, which is kind of what sets everything everything in motion. Right? This is the incident that kind of gets the story started in a, in a way. And uh, throughout this period, the tension and the action is kind of rising. You come into the second act, and the second act is the major, uh, it's represents about usually in a standard play or film, it would be like 50% of, of the film. And the stakes get higher, the characters or characters uh, encounter usually like the first obstacle, let's say, which would take place you know, somewhere over here, and there's the con a point of conflict, then uh, they overcome that conflict, there's some kind of a small resolution, generally, but then things uh, continue to build, and no, that was actually nothing compared to what's coming now, which is when they hit the, you know, the, the highest point of the Film, which is the climax of the film and uh, crisis period, complete crisis, and then it is a resolution and things are somehow resolved in the third in the third act of the, of the film. So uh, yeah, and these you could say these are the plot points, right? That this is, would be the inciting incident that kind of happens towards the end of the first act. And then the the twist that kind of brings in this huge crisis and this is resolved. So this is the this is a, the very standard structure. Not all films are not all films or all stories are structured in this way. But um, there's also you know four four act films and so on and so forth. But I think it's, uh, it is useful to keep in mind that there should be some sort of a narrative built up where the tension builds up and um, then some resolution. Um, just for an example from, um, have you guys, from one of my films, have you guys seen Delhi Waste Wars? Yeah. So in that film, it's about the story of waste pickers in Delhi and it kind of, uh, I start off you know, setting up, there's a, a war brewing between the waste pickers and these private companies that want to come and uh, appropriate the waste from the waste pickers. So the first, at the beginning, we kind of introduced the waste pickers, what are their lives? Then the first, second act is kind of this story between them and the, the private waste companies, which is somewhat resolved, and then there's a bigger challenge, which is the incineration plants, right? So then you kind of move in, like the stakes, every time the stakes are getting higher and higher and higher. So it's kind of useful to keep that in mind that you don't necessarily want to give everything away at the beginning, you know? You want to say that there's this battle, this battle is brewing, these things are happening, but at the same time, um, the action should build to a degree, and there should be some feelings of that resolution. So that's kind of the, the building blocks of an narrative structure. And um, within uh, the act structure, you can break acts down into uh, scenes. So a scene is like one uh, discrete event that is helping to move the plot forward. And within scenes, you have sequences which is kind of a series of shots or an element that makes up the scene and then you have your individual shots which in the second part of the day we're going to discuss a bit more building shots and shot composition and framing and so on and so forth. Um, and one other point to mention is that uh, this, is a, this is a structure for a narrative film for a documentary, there's one more element that's kind of important, which is called the point of attack. And that's the question of where the filmmaker actually enters the storyline. And why does he enter there? You know, what is the, like, I decided to get involved in this, or my interest was this, or, you know, Michael Moore might say, I was so angry when I heard blank and blank and blank 
that I had to do something about it. So I decided to make this film. Or so this is also when it's a personal documentary. Uh, it's it's also a way of thinking of how you introduce yourself into the action. Oops, sorry. Um, so, some different uh, types of documentaries um, that we have is like uh, authoritative documentary. So, you know, it, this would be like Fahrenheit 911, right? The idea is to educate and inform. It's, there's a clearly identified theme or subject, and the documentary is providing evidence to support this claim. Um, this is kind of the most similar to like your mm, easily identifiable propaganda documentary. Um, then we have uh, observational documentaries that are just showing life as it is. So in these types of documentaries, you normally won't see the, the filmmaker at all. You won't hear the filmmaker asking questions. I don't know if any, any of you have seen a, a film about the construction of the Rambla de Raval called En Construcción. No, I think you've seen it all. It's a very, very nice film. Um, actually, it was made uh, by a group at the Pompeo Fabra, and they're kind of experts in this, in this type of uh, documentary filmmaking, with kind of like this fly on the wall technique. And when you're watching the, when you're watching these films, I mean, they've achieved their goal when you think, like, you cannot believe that the people are acting so naturally when there's a camera in the room, because they're so natural that you think, like, wow, it's just how, you know, this is this, is this type of uh, thing. Then there's this uh, dramatized, uh, <coughs> dramatized documentaries, and I'm going to show you a few of these now because actually this is, I would say, kind of the most interesting new thing that's happening lately with documentary films, which is kind of uh, mixing uh, mockumentary, satirical documentaries, and different types of sociological experiments. So uh, Morgan Spurlock's uh, film Super Size Me is this type of film, right? Mm. What would happen if I, as the filmmaker, uh, eat only McDonald's for 30 days? Or I think they made another film about, uh, you know, like, uh, how can a family live without any car button? Or can a family do this? So it's, it's kind of a mixture of, uh, in some ways, kind of integrating reality television thinking even more, but using it to make a point through uh, sociological experiments. So this is a very common and up and coming form of documentary filmmaking. And then there's kind of this poetic reflexive style, which I think is very, um, I mean, actually Canada is the home of the documentary, you know, the National Film Board, but this sort of style I find for me, it's very Canadian. Although the example I will show you is a French, uh, a French director, but uh, yeah, it's it's very about a personal experience, and it's much more poetic. So you have a lot more room, kind of, to play around about uh, how you approach the subject. Um, so this, uh, these, and these are not discrete styles. They're all mixed together. So Gazlan, for example, I would probably say is authoritative or maybe a little bit yeah poetic reflexive. No, I would say it's more authoritative style. So I keep going. And oh and yeah just some elements to keep in mind um, when you're telling stories is who are your characters, what do they want, what are the stakes if they don't get it? What is the tension in the story? Where is the story going, and why? Why does this matter? So, um, okay. So now I just want to show you a few different films, so we can see a little bit of the different uh, styles. Have any of you seen uh, this film? 
not. Oh, yeah, uh, sorry, in English it's uh, Darwin's Night. Yes. Darwin's Night. Yes. <laughs> no, you like it. Oh, you did it? No. You didn't like it? <laughs> um, well, I, sh I showed it in my class once. <laughs> it didn't work very well. Um, so I think, I mean, the reason I wanted to show this film, I think, is that I think it's kind of a best, for me, it's one of the, it's one of the best examples of a film <coughs> that um, is made, in a sense, in a political ecology framework. Mm -hmm. And what he does in the film is he's looking at uh, the fisheries in uh, Lake Victoria, where an invasive species has been introduced, the Nile perch. So beginning from the, the upset of the ecological balance within the lake, he <coughs> moves outwards to look at all the different impacts of globalization within, within this uh, fishing community. And he looks at, you know, what is the trade with Europe of the fish, how is it impacting the local livelihoods, uh, ties it in with the arms trade and with, um, you know, European Commission policies. So um, I find that it's really a good example of a, a film that uh, critiques modernization and globalization very effectively. And it's also, um, I mean, it is also a very persuasive form of, of propaganda or, you know, persuasive argument that was all, uh, also very, very heavily contested by some people because of the specific perspective that it, it showed. Um, not so much as, you know, some other of the films that we've seen have been critiqued because of um, misinformation um, or recreation of facts. Actually, some people tried to, they, at one point I think they tried to kind of accuse him of, of staging some of the scenes and it was, it was not true. But it does uh, only show one, one very specific view. So I'm going to show you a little clip of this film. Are we doing for time? Oh, we don't have so much time. Okay, I'm going to show you a bit. The Africa in the land, it's a source of source of life.
Pronto.
like, um, uh, what's that, Slumdog Millionaire, where a lot of Indian uh, viewers were appalled by the fact that India was portrayed in the international, you know, it's an international film, yeah. mm -hmm. that India was portrayed in this place as well, and such and such. I think it's because what she's talking about, they can't help themselves. Like but, they, but they can help themselves, or they are uh, uh, embedded in this global economy that give them a specific role in which they will continue having, you know, bad luck. Yeah, I mean, the critique is... is why there should be hope? This is my question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, why, why should you, the director, giving the... Well, I mean, and, and I think this is another good question about what, I mean, what do you want to accomplish with your film, right? So most, if you mm -hmm. actually want to inspire action, mm -hmm. then uh, there is an argument for, for, for telling people that there's something that they can do. I mean, it, people find it disturbing if it's so dark, but there's no point of redemption. And I think this is something that, you know, okay, with the, with the gas lines, right, what can you do? You can join your anti-fracking group, you become involved, you become, you know, there's some, it's a concrete thing you can do. And maybe in this film, also, there could be something specific that he could, he could have framed it in that way, and, you know, go join the anti-globalization protest. <laughs> but I, he doesn't, he doesn't explicitly tell you to do anything, you know? That's the whole point, is that you are supposed to come to your own conclusions, and it doesn't have, which I find it also a bit, I find it a bit irritating when at the end of the film they like throw in these few lines of, you know, uplifting hope. Oh, but things can be different, and things can change. It's like, yeah, you know, personally it doesn't help me. Yeah. No, I just wanted to say that there's just the, Danger, or let's say, when you portray a whole people or a whole country or continent as something, and you don't recognize that um, you know the complexities that are in there. But what I'm trying to say is that it's kind of like what the aid uh, business tries to do. It's like, oh, they're so helpless; they can't do nothing about it. It's you that can do something for them, yeah. right? So um, it kind of in the discourse of things, it disempowers. I haven't seen this film, and I don't know if this is the only, you know, side of things that it is showing. Mm -hmm. But um, for some, the, sorry, for some of the Indian, for example, it, it did kind of portray this kind of India. Yeah. yeah I, I think the, the filmmaker was kind of trying to get away from this kind of NGOization of, of Africa, mm -hmm. for example. But uh, in the end, he fell into the, the same trap. Because uh, he was he was at the same time depicting a pornography of poverty as he was making the film, so uh, I think that's what I found a bit uh, problematic with the film. So what would you do differently, if, like if you were trying to make a similar film? Well, I mean, obviously, as you said, there are complexities behind it. If you if you just show you can, for example, show the the class structure that in that society. You know, Tanzania is not made up by a bunch of starving people. There are people who are, are you know, who are employing these people in the factories and are exploiting these people. You can show that better. Yeah. Well, you, could you could speak to people locally who think they, they know some solutions. You know, like some NGOs might criticize this and say this is not the way it should be done. It should be done a different way. And just by filming and portraying that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, for me, I will go back to what Salvatore said, that what if there is no hope, and there are instances in life, in people, when you don't see any hope, when you don't see, and when you only feel disempowered, when you only feel like you cannot do anything. And is it the problem of a documentary to only give solutions or show the complexity of the conflict? Sometimes you just show an instance of life, which is very powerful. It's at the instance when you feel you don't have any way out. I mean, isn't that like, what is the purpose of a documentary? Like you said, what, is, what inspires you? And if what inspires you to is to show that at some point you don't see a way out. No? 
Maintenant, malheureusement, ça ne se fait plus parce qu'il y a des machines tellement performantes. Mais à la oui, j'ai eu l'année avec mes voisines, avec mes... le blé, comme le riz aussi se faisait à main. Et bien, euh, on se. Pourquoi je vais mon grand hein? On gagnait, on ramassait le blé, les épis, les beaux épis qu'il y avait. On était fourbus et on rentrait avec nos sacs, nos tabliers. Euh, et après, c'était une bonne partie de rire, de boire, du café, du loyer. Euh, voilà. Je suis née là, dans ce mars, et j'y mourais. Merci à vous, mais c'est pas Je suis confuse parce que vous m'avez eu. Ah oui, je suis très contente. Moi, je me rappelle de ça quand j'allais faire ça avec ma grand-mère. Dans une temps, on faisait les gens qui nous ont ramassé parce qu'il n'y avait pas à manger tout le monde. Ils allaient taper les vins, ils faisaient de la farine. Faire du vin. Maintenant, on ne rapille plus, on ne l'a plus pour euh, manger. Et là, tu sais tout ça, quand je voulais les gens qui l'avaient fait. Je ne sais pas si j'ai
it becomes very personal and she really goes through it kind of in an emotional exploratory way. Reminded me of Amelie Poulain, like in the beginning, especially. <laughs> 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 yeah. And saying, uh, uh, this is you, and this is us on the road, and then we arrive, and this is the way. But there is something like everything has a proposal. The music is not only to play around, but it's a rap, it's talking about that reality. Yeah. Yeah. But also, what I want to find also really interesting is the way that voiceover appears or how she introduces the character. Vin Vendors works like that as well. It's, like, it's just by the of film and then it moves on. But you understand what is this voice of God? And then, like, it, it, the, 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 the writer appears only to, to make a connection with the audience. The very slight, it, it, he's not like the cloud, like my own. Or his life is this hipster that uh, can be anyone here, let's, let's check what is happening there. You know. Much more sophisticated, I would say. I was against the, the, the hipster in my film, but I don't like it. You should have been. No way. You I should was, have been. You no way. No, 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 I was just a bit at the same time. I want to appear, just make some connection. It's a, it's a good thing to, 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 to do like a pop scale. The, the other ones are fantastic, you know. But this one is like, this is from kind so, Yeah. I mean, this, this is your film is, it was made for such an audience. It's made yeah. for the Vice audience. And if you, who do Vice, I mean, who has authority, if you go back to this idea of like the ethos, is the hipster, so they can see it better through the eyes of a hipster. If it was somebody else, a Brazilian, telling them the story, maybe they wouldn't identify in the same way. So that's the other question of who your who your audience is. About about um, her, she's been making she's been making films since the 60s. She's one of the first to make uh, like political documentaries, and she has ones about the Black Panthers and all kinds of things. And I think you can see most of them online. Okay, we take a break. Now.